thank you very much for coming to this week's uh, research seminar at the Museo Nacional de Ciencias Naturales. This will be our last one of this academic year. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to invite this week Professor John Bridle, um, who I, I'm not sure I've ever seen him give a seminar before actually, even though I met him in 1995 when we were both doing our PhDs at the University of Leeds. So John, like me, is from South London. Uh, he studied biological sciences in Manchester. Then he went to work on uh, the roles of sexual selection and assortative mating in uh, grasshopper speciation and hybrid, zone, hybrid zones with uh, Roger Butlin at the University of Leeds. Um, his uh, postdoctoral period took him around Cardiff, uh, the Zoological Society of London, and maybe that's it. And he was in the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid for six months as well. Um, and then he was employed as a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol between 2006 and 2018. Um, while he was there, he, for several years, he was also in charge of equality and diversity in biological sciences in Bristol, and he um, obtained, successfully obtained a silver Athena Swan accreditation for biology there, which is a pretty substantial task. So well done for doing that, John, as well. Uh, he's been employed, he's kind of realized his dream of working at University College London since 2018, and um, he uh, earlier this year he became the director of the Centre for Biodiversity and Environment Research. So he works on areas including speciation, um, evolution at range margins, the limits to uh, uh, evolution at range margins, which will be the topic he's talking about today. He's worked on many different taxa, including snails, grasshoppers, cichlids, apparently. Um, and he's, in the last few years, he's mainly been working on Drosophila and butterflies and Senecio plants on the slopes of uh, Mount Etna in Sicily. Um, as well as his science, uh, he's extremely generous with his time and his knowledge. Um, I've successfully um, got through a few interviews thanks to the helpful sort of... Uh, guide to interviews that he wrote about 20 years ago, and I've used that now uh, as part of my work in Formation here in the museum. And also, uh, he's a great lover of Spain. He did most of the field work for his PhD in the Cantabrian Mountains and the Picos de Europa. And uh, when I first came out to Spain in 2003, he gave me a really helpful about three-page Word document with all the best places to have a vermouth in Madrid and other social and cultural highlights of the city. So without further ado, thank you very much, John, for coming. And we look forward to hearing your, what you've got to tell us today. Thanks very much. That's a, that's a very generous introduction. Thank you. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, one of my favorite cities in the world is Madrid. Um, I don't know, should, this, should both of these be on? I don't know if I should switch that off. Maybe I will. Yeah, so it's great to be, uh, to be back in Madrid. I think most of those uh, places are probably woefully out of date since they were kind of founded in, in the late 90s, uh, most of those places for Vermouth and uh, Menu del Dia and so forth. But it's great to be here as well in this fantastic building in your 250th anniversary, so congratulations to that. I've, I'm looking forward to looking at the um, displays you have later on today and to meeting hopefully many of you uh, this afternoon. Um, so yeah, so... I've been really interested throughout my career in understanding limits to adaptation um, in response to environmental change. And that's become a really fundamental issue, I think, given that most, if not all species, are going to be facing utterly transformed environments in the decades to come. So all species are going to have to evolve in response to changes in their environment, not just from climate change, but also from changes in the communities that they interact with and the types, of, the types of environment they're facing. So not just how different the environment is, but also how variable it is, and also how predictable it is. And I think I've become quite interested in understanding the consequences for 
biodiversity are facing this new environment where a lot of the information the environment's providing are no longer that reliable. So rather optimistically, I've called the talk Understanding Limits to Adaptation. But I think it's really fundamental to realize just how what's going on within species in terms of populations and within species biodiversity, genetic variation and variation in phenotypes, how that really dictates the levels at which organisms interact at, at other scales uh, between species within communities, as well as what's going on within organisms in terms of their microbiomes, which are also communities, as well as their interactions between tissues and cells during their lifetime. So today I'm going to be talking mostly about two systems that we've worked on in detail. Um, Senecio daisies on the, on the slopes of Mount Etna, um, which are fantastic plants, they're fantastic for understanding behavior. Plants kind of stay where they are while you're measuring their behavior. Their behavior is often very showy. They make flowers and they make seeds and you can count those seeds, you can count those flowers, and you can see how successful those, those uh, plants are in the following generation. So plant behavior, plant sensitivity to the environment is really quite easy to study compared to a lot of other organisms. What's nice about butterflies is that the European scientists know a lot and European naturalists know a lot about butterflies and their interactions with other organisms. So butterflies are fantastic for understanding biotic interactions, so how communities are going to change in response to changes in the background environment, so in the climate, as well as in um, water availability. So over the next sort of hopefully 45 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a kind of brief introduction to what's been a classic question in evolutionary biology for the last 60 years or so, which is why do populations stop adapting in response to environmental change? So why do species have limits to the distribution? So it's actually a question that was really founded at UCL by, by J.B.S. Haldane, mostly who considered this idea about how um, changes in the environment interact to cause limits to what populations and species can do. So that's partly why I'm so excited to be back at UCL. But in particular, I'm going to talk about the need to understand phenotypic plasticity as a way of understanding these limits and how they form in communities. Um, by plasticity, we're really talking about the sensitivity of genotypes to the environment. So how those genes come to be sensitive to particular types of cues that dictate the phenotypes, the somas that they make through their lifetimes. I'll talk then in sort of a little bit of detail about what we've been doing to try and understand um, plasticity and its ability to evolve at the edge of ecological margins in, in Senecio, in daisies, um, on the side of Mount Etna. And then I'll talk a bit about work that we're continuing here in collaboration with Rob, but also with Alex, who's in the audience, Alex Piggott, where we're basically going to start a collaboration. We've started a collaboration with you guys thinking about um, butterflies in Europe and their responses to climate change and how their life history affects the way that they'll respond to climate change. So this is a question that's kind of bugged me ever since I was like, I guess since I went to some my, since my first field course was the question of why do species have narrow ranges? Why are all species limited in the distribution in space and in time? All species go extinct eventually, and all species are only found in some places and some habitats. And that seems a bit strange when you consider that, well, we consider that when you go for a walk in the mountains, you're quite happy, you're quite comfortable with the idea that at some point trees stop growing, at some point there's a tree line, and then you get into these kind of shrubs. And then there's no very little plant life at all above a certain point. So we're quite comfortable with the idea that adaptation stops at some point. But we're also comfortable at the same time with the idea that within the distributions of many of these species, there'll be changes in gene frequency and changes in traits. The populations will be locally adapted across environmental gradients within their range. But for some reason, at the edge of their range, they stop adapting. And we really don't know why. If we worked out why that, why that happened and where it happened, we could predict when populations will drop out of communities or species will drop out of communities in response to environmental change, the critical points where they stop interacting with other species. We'd also be able to predict why there are patterns of biodiversity, why biodiversity changes across gradients. If we knew why species, why some species have narrow niches and other species have wider niches, we'd be able to make predictions, if you like, this is basically the foundation of where all community ecology comes from, is understanding thresholds for rates of adaptation. So we're left with these kind of conundrums that 
we don't really understand why populations stop adapting given they can adapt within their range. So if you, if you sampled trees low down in the mountain, low down at sea level of this same species, they'd probably be a lot better at coping with that environment than the ones higher up. So they'd be different within their range, but not at the edge. And we know that the variation that we find when we look at populations, there's lots of variation in genetic in um, traits that affect fitness. Sometimes these can form these climbs, so changes within species across their range. But we don't know why, given these two things are true, we don't know why there should be points where they stop adapting. And these kind of question drove people like Haldane to ask the question about what stops populations adapting across spatial gradients in the environment. So if you look on this, uh, on this, this kind of, this is like a cartoon way of thinking about it. What we're basically seeing in nature is not this situation. So if you imagine a, a distribution of a species in space, and this is the phenotype, imagine it has a phenotype that can perfectly match the optimum across its range. So across its range, say this is, this is some change in the environment, say in temperature. And there is a way that these populations can match that change to make a, a phenotype that's at the optimum. So this is the optimum line, and this is what actually the populations are doing. So we imagine there is a way of doing that. And yet we see that in most populations, most species more or less do this. There's only a narrow bit of the environment where they're able to adapt to changing environments. The rest of the time, what they actually do falls short of what's expected from selection, essentially. So we're asking the question, why do populations do this rather than doing this? And this is interesting, these types of models, because they tend to couple this ability to adapt or this adaptation with, to the local environment with the ability of a population to sustain its density. So what we actually see in nature tend to be populations which are abundant in some situations, but as they get away from their optimum, they become very rare. And presumably another species takes their place. So why do species replace each other along environmental gradients rather than having populations which do this? And they're very, very distributed across very wide ranges. So really, this is getting at the heart of understanding niche evolution and niche breadth. And these models explicitly couple how well a population is adapted locally to its ability to maintain a high population size. And there's lots and lots of models that have been made to try and explain why populations are all in this state and very rarely, if at all, in the state at the top. And if I can summarize what's taken me like 15 years to even get close to understanding, the key parameters that determine why populations fail to adapt are basically these four things. Firstly, you've got to have genetic variation in fitness. You've got to have alleles in a population that confer differences in fitness. This comes down Darwin, this is Darwin's second principle, if you like, there must be heritable variation in fitness. Otherwise, you can't transmit that information to daughters and sons. So you've got to have adaptive potential in a population. But one of the key innovations that Haldane made was he realized that all of that variation in the population carries a cost. So having genotypes in the population being created by sex, being created by gene flow, that variation around the mean, around the optimum, allows you to evolve, but also carries a cost because a lot of your genotypes are not on the optimum. A lot of your phenotypes are not at the optimum in that place in space. So the second thing that's important is having is how fast you can replace individuals. So your fecundity, when you're at the optimum, so organisms that can replace individuals quickly can sustain a higher amount of variance before they go extinct. So they can sustain more genetic load. So that's an important thing. We, we see that in nature. Populations which grow quickly and have large numbers of offspring can in some situations rapidly evolve or rapidly exploit new, new niches and move into new places. The strength of selection matters, which is basically how much you're punished as a, as a phenotype for not being on the optimum, how much your selection declines away from the optimum. And that, that actually affects it in kind of complicated ways, which I'm not going to go into. But the last point that's quite important, which is kind of intuitive, is where if, is if the gradient in selection is, or the gradient in the required trait mean, or the change in the mean is too much for a given bit of space, if the, if the gradient is too steep, populations will not be able to adapt. So there's these four things that we think contribute to explaining why populations have limits to their distributions in space and time. Why they go, why all populations go extinct somewhere or sometime. The point I want to make in terms of plasticity, in terms of this amazing tendency or ability that genes have 
to make things around them, to make phenotypes that buffer their experience and their exposure to the environment, the thing that that sensitivity of genotypes to the environment can do, that flexibility of genotypes, what it can do, it affects, in, in particular, affects two main parameters there. It affects the amount of genetic variance in fitness, and it affects the steepness of the gradient. Because if the same genotype can make the appropriate phenotype across lots of different parts of the range, then clearly this, the gradient itself isn't that strong. The gradient as the genotypes see it isn't very steep. Okay, so the population is, or the, the genotype is able to match the optimum across a large bit of ecological space. It's kind of interesting. It's a good thing to be able to do. But the kind of counter, the other side of the coin, if you like, is by doing that, is actually masking a lot of the variation that could be important for adaptation of new forms of plasticity. Okay, so the plasticity matches the optimum, so the mean fitness will be good across a large bit of space in ecology, but it means this potential to evolve might go down because if it matches the phenotype everywhere, even with different genotypes, it's not going to, selection isn't going to be able to change those gene frequencies very easily. Okay, so you're reducing the amount of load but you're also reducing the amount of adaptive potential. This is a kind of general sort of point, I think, about what plasticity does or can do if it's adaptive, is it basically smooths the environment. It reduces these little steep bits of gradient. It means populations can weather difficult bits of the environment by changing their phenotype. There might be an energetic cost to doing that, but essentially it's better than being in the wrong place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time. So it smooths ecological gradients in time and space. And if you think about it, it's very hard to imagine genotypes for complex organisms living on the planet in most places unless they were able to do this. So if coral, coral reefs couldn't decide when to spawn and to release their gametes, they would be releasing most of the time gametes into thin air or thin water and nothing would come of all that reproductive effort. Similarly, if birds just chose when to reproduce at random, in European countries, they clearly wouldn't do very well. Butterflies, as we'll see, you know, they choose where they lay their eggs and what types of climate, what types of host plants. That has big effects of the exposure of their offspring to environments when they're very young larvae or when they're older larvae. So it's a kind of parental care. You see, the parental care is a way of like reducing that, that gap between what your genotype is, what your phenotype is, and what the environment is demanding. You can get into like movement, so moving around into different places. That obviously also smooths the environment. You choose where to put your eggs into places or you choose where to, where to forage in places where prey items are abundant. Similarly with the sort of foraging that plants do when they put out roots or when they grow in particular places. So the key point here is that alleles have got agency via phenotypes. So things like these goats, or us when we go into the shade during a midweek afternoon or into a bar, we clearly, that has a huge effect on our fitness, the fact that we make these good decisions in the face of variable environments. The consequences of making bad decisions are at best a waste of a lot of effort and reproductive effort, at worst, death and zero fitness. So this means that this behavior of alleles across life stages, across sexes, across different environments, that determines these current ecological limits and that will determine the sensitivity of ecosystems to climate change. And so that raises this really important question oops, of how quickly can new adaptive plasticity evolve, given that everything's going to be new, right? The next decades, everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be stuff that people, have, organisms have never experienced before. So the question becomes how quickly can um, genotypes change their sensitivity to the environment in response to these new challenges? Now, this takes us into this tricky and, and worrying Thing called what we call non-adaptive plasticity, which is that plasticity is great, but also it can lead to some very, very bad decisions. When you're faced with an environment that historically your genes have really experienced very, very rarely or not at all, often genes make bad decisions. If you've ever learned to dive, or some of you may even have learned to drive, which is a much more destructive activity, um, you're often taught, you know, the worst thing to do when you're learning to do something new is to panic keep your adrenaline levels low. But of course, producing a lot of adrenaline is a natural response to an environment that's quite crazy. Driving at 120 kilometers an hour down a motorway, being 30 meters under the water with a you know, mask on and an oxygen tank, it's also quite a crazy experience. It's natural for you to feel 
anxious. But a lot of what we learn is you don't respond to those cues and you learn to be calm. That's training. You have to train yourself to do that. Similarly, we have to train ourselves not to enjoy animal fat as much as maybe our Neolithic ancestors would have liked because we're exposed to animal fat a lot more than we were a few thousand years ago. Okay, so obesity, epidemics, these are all issues which cause non-adaptive um, non behavior. I might also argue that in my country, my home country, exposure to social media, a new form of information that we couldn't trust, didn't have any information to judge its veracity, also led to some particularly unpleasant and difficult decisions, which now desperately need to be reversed. Okay, so non-adaptive plasticity is very important. And it's a very worrying thing because we're getting to situations now with new environments, there's no reason why populations will respond in an appropriate way. There's other cases where obviously organisms don't have a full information about the environment, and that's also affected by novel environments. Think about the case of Hamlet. Hamlet actually makes the right decision, but he makes the decision a bit late. So he's faced with this kind of crazy bit of information he can't really judge its, its truth or its relevance. He thinks he's being tempted by the devil, but instead he delays and delays and delays until it's too late and causes absolute zero fitness for his family. Okay, so it's okay. You can also respond the right way, but too late. As Hamlet does. Or you can be like these sheep who basically they might want to produce very large offspring to survive the winter, very large lambs, but unless they, that mother's got enough food to eat, she won't be able to produce large lambs. So you might want to behave a certain way and respond to the environment. Your genes might be trying to create a phenotype, but you haven't got the opportunity to make that phenotype. And these issues actually complicate a lot some of the some of our attempts to understand sensitivity of genes to the environment. But in novel environments, previous cues become unreliable, and that means that often we can expect in coming years, populations will start to do really stupid things. And that's going to be really important when we think about the more ecological community aspect, where we start to think about mismatches between different trophic levels being caused by populations responding to cues which are no longer reliable. And it could well be that we're actually just at the threshold where uh, changes in the environment now, variant climate variance now is around a mean which previously was the extreme. And so every hot year now takes us into novel, like completely novel environments where organisms might suffer catastrophic reductions in fitness. So it becomes really, really important to understand how easily novel forms of sensitivity to the environment can evolve. And that's basically what we've been thinking a lot about in Sicily, as well as drinking fantastic wine and not nearly as good as Spanish wine, but still very good wine. Um, so we've been asking the question, this question about how easily populations can evolve new forms of plasticity at their margins in um, Senecio, in, in ragworts, which are kinds of daisies which live on the side of Mount Etna and are distributed along these elevational gradients. And we're kind of testing these hypotheses here, this idea that this adaptive plasticity might prevent this loss of fitness within a species native environment. But as soon as you go beyond that native environment, we might expect um, fitness to go down. And that's a, that's a basic, simple hypothesis that we're testing here. So that's this first idea that the phenotype can match. So the genotype can match the, the, the environment. The phenotype can match the optimum across the native range, but not in the new part of the range. That's, that's our theory. But there's also this idea that in novel conditions, we might see new, new um, expression of variation that we didn't see before, because selection has kind of favoured one or two different ways of using the environment in the native environment. In the new environment, you do something different. So we might expect there to be more potential for adaptation at the edge of the range in a novel environment. And that might mean that we see a loss of fitness, but the potential for rapid evolution of plasticity. And this is what we've been doing in collaboration with uh, uh, people at the University of Catania, as well as Oxford and Napoli, and as well as Montpellier as well. So a real pan-European research program we've been doing. And we've basically been doing this really nice thing you can do with plants, which is you can move cuttings. So rather than having to move families around to check their sensitivity to the environment, which is what we do with butterflies or, or, other, or any sexual organism, um, with a, in the case of sexual organisms like plants, they're remarkable that some of them you can just take cuttings and grow many, many copies of the same genotype and then transplant the same genotype to different places. And that's what we've been doing on Etna 
with two sort of plant species which are found at the top and the bottom of the mountain, which are closely related but show big differences in their leaf structure. So we know leaf forms, leaf traits have a big effect on their fitness. We know that they match high elevation and low elevation habitats. And so we can use leaf shape as a kind of trait where we might expect to see plasticity. And we can ask what the consequences of that plasticity are for fitness using the same genotype that we transplant up and down the mountain. And we can do this in the, in the thousands of clones. Usually we use about 20 clones for each genotype in each different environment. So we transplant thousands of clones of what were basically 80 genotypes that we collected um, from natural populations in the, in the low elevation part of the range or the high elevation part of the range of the other species. And then we can basically look at um, how their um, sensitivity changes in response to different environments and how the consequences of their, their decisions for fitness. Um, and we measure their phenotypes, their leaf shape, their physiology, their behavior of their roots, um, as well as their relationship to fitness. And then we can also look using our RNA-seq, we can look at gene expression. We can look at the genetics that's underpinning what genes are doing to create these phenotypes, how hard they're working and across which, bit, which bits of the genome. So we test for increased genetic variance in plasticity in novel environments, which would be nice because that would tell us that there's the potential for rapid evolution of new forms of sensitivity. We can look at the types of genomic regions associated with plasticity in novel environments and ask are they the same as the ones that are being expressed in the native environment. And we can get this general get at this general question about what's the effect of plasticity on evolution, particularly when you contrast native environments with novel ones. And actually the experiment I'm gonna talk about mostly today is one we've done on only one species, where we wanted to kind of simulate from the low elevation species, we wanted to simulate the kinds of genotypes, the kinds of variation that's being created by sex and gene flow all the time. So we took population, we took samples of genotypes from healthy, adults, so things that have succeeded in the low elevation part of the range, in the native part of the range. We then made crosses, and then we got the seed from the crosses and grew those and took cuttings from those seeds. So we're looking at, if you like, the standing, the segregating variation in the population. Now, when you sample a population you know, of adults, you've you're already got selection has already happened, so you're only looking at a subset of the genotypes. So here we're kind of simulating the kind of genotypes that could constantly be created by selection, sorry, by, by recombination. Because um, as I say, if you just look at what's already there in the population, what's succeeded as adults, you're not seeing the full amount of genetic variation that's possible. There's a lot of gametes that never make it, right? A lot of zygotes that never make it. So we wanted to have an idea about how much potential there was for evolution when you cross parental types within a species. So we grow these crosses. We also, by doing that, we're also able to look at the um, effect of a, the average effect of a given parent. And in genetics, that tells us what we call the additive genetic variance in fitness. So it tells us how much variance there is in fitness that can be transmitted by a parent to an offspring. That's the result of just that, those genes effects on phenotypes. So we're able to get an idea of how much adaptive potential there is by looking at additive effects on plasticity and the effects of that plasticity on fitness. So we grow lots and lots of plants in um, greenhouses in Sicily. We then transplant them as cuttings. We grow them into, into thousands of cuttings and transplant them into the field at various different places. So we have the top of the mountain, or not quite the top, but as high up to the top as we can get with a car from 2,000 meters outside their normal experience and right at the edge of their normal experience, as well as low down where they're quite used to being. So at the edge and in a novel environment. And then we sample them. So this is about 7,200 7, cuttings in total. We sample all the flowers after they've been growing for six months. So we get an estimate of their fitness. Flowers typically lead to seeds. So that means it's quite a good estimate for a short lived plant of how fit it's gonna be. And we end up with basically with thousands of envelopes of seeds in the University of Catania, which we spend months and months counting. Brilliant, brilliant work. And we look at the leaf physiology and we get RNA samples from the leaves as well to look at the gene expression, which I'm not gonna talk about very much today. The first thing, first two main results from this work is that you do indeed see a reduction in adaptive plasticity 
So this is the transplant. This is within the native range of the edge and in the novel part of the environment. This is the fitness per genotype, the average fitness per genotype um, of, of the offspring from these crosses. And this is based on the number of flowers they produce on average. And you can see that okay, there's a lot of variation, but the plasticity seems to be maintaining fitness within the experienced bit of the range, but at the edge of the range, plasticity, um, well, the fitness drops. So the plasticity seems to run out. It doesn't seem to be as effective in, in um, buffering the effect of the environment as we might expect. What's kind of more interesting is that there's much more, there isn't, this isn't just sort of noise and phenotypic noise and lots of variation among clones within genotypes. There's actually genetic variance in this relative fitness. And outside the range here, this is at 200 meters and 1500 meters and at 500 meters, this is like a Bayesian um, density plot. So it's a plot of our best estimate of genetic variance in those places. You can see that there's very little genetic variance in this part of the range because all the genotypes are doing more or less the same thing. So the genetic variance in fitness is very low. It's a bit more here, but outside the range, there's lots and lots of genetic variance in relative fitness. That's kind of cool. It means that genes are causing how, how different genotypes are responding to the environment, how different fathers are different or mothers are responding to the environment, affects their fitness. So that's kind of cool. There's a reduction in fitness and an increase in variance of fitness outside the range. And the genetic variance in relative fitness increases outside the native range. So there's potential for evolution. And this switch from adaptive to non-adaptive plasticity. What's kind of even more interesting in a way is that within the range, the, the uh, parents that have high fitness, the parents that have got genes that confer high fitness in the native part of the range, seem to do worse at the outside of the range. And the ones that are doing well at the edge of the range, the ones, and they'll do pretty badly outside the range, but the ones that have the highest relative fitness, as you can see from these crosses of these reaction norms here, they tend to do much worse. So there seems to be a trade-off. It seems to be that there are alleles segregating within the native range, which if they were, which, which would, if they could get to the edge of the range, they'd do quite well. If they get into the novel environment, they'd do the right thing. But it seems like they have, a, they have a reduction in fitness when they're seen in the native part of the range, and that's why we don't see them as adults. But this means if we just went into the field and sampled adults and said, well, this is genetic variation that's, that's possible for evolutionary rescue, we'd be underestimating. But the reason they're not constantly moving up the mountain is because there's a trade-off, because those genotypes don't really get established long enough to be able to seed populations at the edge. So that's kind of good news in a way. There's a high potential for the evolution of adaptive plasticity just from existing variation within the range, but most of that variation we don't see unless we do these crosses. So there's kind of a trade-off, which is what's nice, what we expect. What's also interesting is that a lot of this variance in fitness comes down to variance in genetic variance in the amount of plasticity an organism has or the type of plasticity it has. So here we're kind of quantifying the change in uh, this is just leaf area we're showing here, but we've got lots of other traits we do. We have to do a, do a multivariate analysis, it's quite complicated. But we're looking at a phenotypic change from, from, the, from the low part of the range to the middle of the range, or to the edge of the range rather, there, and the amount of plasticity that's found. So this is just how much the average trait mean changes for a given genotype across those different environments. And we can see there's probably there's more plasticity overall between 500 to 2,000 meters, as you might expect, than to the edge. But what's really interesting, I think, is that there's, there's more genetic variance in plasticity at the edge of the range, sorry, at the new part of the environment than at the edge, which again is what's predicted by theory, but has not really been shown before. Okay, so, point is, the point has come back. So this is basically the genetic, the, the component of that variation that's genetic you can see all of this, most of these traits show uh, genetic variance that's significant outside the range, but wasn't significant within the range. So all of these things that we thought might be true seem to be true in this particular situation, which is kind of nice, I suppose. And then we can actually ask, let's just take the genotypes that do really well in the home range, but badly at the edge, and the ones that seem to do okay at the edge or in the novel part of the range, and see what they look like. And this is just selecting these genotypes that do well and do badly for various different trait values. So this is leaf area, leaf complexity, number of indents, specific leaf area, various traits 
and it gets kind of complicated, but and for many of these, you can see there is a difference between these um, AP, which we call the adaptive potential genotypes, the ones that seem to do well at the edge of the range, sorry, I keep saying that, seem to do well in the novel part of the range, but badly everywhere else, and the ones that seem to only do well in the native range, but badly at the edge. So there's a kind of like this, I mean, it's easy to sort of make stories up from this stuff, but what's quite nice is that there does seem to be a correlation between the amount of plasticity or the type of plasticity a genotype has and how well it does at the edge and in the novel environment. And it seems like making this kind of decision to be kind of more, com just stay this, uh, just as complex, but just kind of get smaller is kind of a bad thing to do, but it's very good in this part of the range. So you're kind of like a specialist. You know, you kind of hone to your plasticity to match what you should be doing in the native range compared to these guys that kind of don't change that much, really. They kind of like, they're more sort of like, um, conservative in what they do in response to the environment. And if you think about that, that's quite a good thing to do in an environment you have very little information, very little information about. If you go somewhere completely new that you don't know anything about, it's best to keep quiet, just to do very little and just like bide your time. I sort of think about like Clint Eastwood in those spaghetti westerns, you know, where he goes to the Spanish speaking bar and the English speaking bar, he's in the sort of Mexican bar and he's in the European bar. And he's basically, you know, he behaves exactly the same way. He doesn't say very much. Every so often he does something like shoot somebody or make some wisecrack. But generally his behavior is very reserved because he's gathering information. He's not reacting quickly to information until he's got lots of different sources of information that will corroborate that this guy is going to shoot him or that guy is cheating or, or whatever. Okay, so this I call the kind of Clint Eastwood genotype. It's a good thing to do in a new environment is to do very little. But let's see, we're, we're currently we're doing a lot more work now to try and quantify the gene networks involved in these different, these contrasting forms of response and their consequences for fitness, which is all under analysis and I'm not going to talk about today. I better, probably better hurry up a little bit as well. So, of course, I'm sure many of you are saying, well, hang on, this is just cuttings. I mean, plants don't reproduce by cuttings, so this is all nonsense because plants reproduce by seeds. And you're absolutely right. So... By transplanting cuttings, we're taking away a lot of the, the amazing things that plants do in terms of determining, deciding when to germinate and their early growth investment and all those decisions they make very early on in life. So thanks to thinking about that, we've got to do a whole other set of experiments the following year where we do the same thing with families of seeds rather than cuttings. And we're contrasting those results with what the uh, cuttings are telling us. I won't go into that now, but it says some quite interesting things. So to summarize what we're seeing in Senecio, it's basically we're seeing adaptive plasticity within the range, but not outside. And that's kind of bad news in the sense of, it means that as we go into extreme environments and unpredictable environments because of climate change, we can expect populations and species to do silly things, to behave in bad ways for big systems to collapse. <laughs> But the kind of shining silver lining of that is it also might mean there's an expression of a lot of genetic variation of fitness, which might allow populations to quickly evolve in response to climate change, maybe. Genotypes associated with potential for adaptation at the edge often have reduced fitness within the range. Presumably they're maintained at low frequency or in many genotypes, they're kind of their effects are kind of masked. We don't really know. At the moment, we're, we're going on now, we're doing a lot of analyses of gene expression across elevations and across these different kinds of genotypes. Um, I'm comparing the variance in fitness and the gene networks involved across seasons, as well as uh, across genotypes and across elevations. And we really want to get to the heart of understanding these trade-offs in fitness that pin species in certain places. So how maybe there's a trade-off between your investment in interactions with other species or your investment in growing quickly compared to being resistant to a drought or being resistant to um, bacteria or fungi early in life. So at the heart of understanding biodiversity limits and biodiversity evolution, we have to understand trade-offs. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking about plants now, and I'm quickly going to, I guess I've got 15 minutes, I've got 10 minutes, I guess, so I'm going to quick, very quickly talk about some of the work we've been doing on butterflies. Um, because I want to talk about the work that we're doing with Robin with Alex, um, and because I like butterflies as well. And butterflies are really cool because 
We know a lot about their biotic interactions. We know a lot about how they interact with other species, particularly how they interact with plants, because plants are obviously trying really hard for butterflies not to eat them. And they're trying to get butterflies to pollinate them, but not eat their leaves. And unfortunately, butterflies are quite stubborn in that. They want to do both things. But what we can study with butterflies in particular is this other great thing here, which is the effect of the steepness of the gradient on where populations stop adapting in response to environmental change. And this takes us all the way back to some of Rob's work back in the mid-90s. This was Rob's PhD supervisor, Chris Thomas. And he did some amazing work on this part of North Wales, the Great Orm. And basically what a lot of this kind of work shows is that populations of any organisms that have specialist interactions with other species tend to have these very steep gradients very locally as well as globally. So if you look at the UK, you know, at a sort of a large scale, you can see patchy distributions of butterflies, but also even on a very fine scale, just a couple of kilometers, they're found in these very, st these patches with very steep edges, because often they're restricted to certain types of host plant. And this you can call the kind of problem of the specialist, which is that biotic interactions tend to generate quite steep gradients. And it takes a hell of a lot of plasticity to get past those steep gradients and start using another host plant mainly because there's an antagonistic interaction with the host plant. The host plant doesn't want the, the butterfly to be able to use more than one host plant. They tend to get very specialized. And so it's hard to switch host plants because you've got all this, this um, you know, cocktail of, of uh, toxins that they have to cope with as larvae in order to consume the leaves. So we need to understand what organisms do to try and how they can maybe get around this problem of being a specialist, of evolving these specialist interactions with other organisms in order to respond and exploit new parts of the, of the climate which might become available. And the organism we've been working on a lot to try and understand this is the brown argus butterfly, this wonderful blue butterfly, which the green spots here tell you where this butterfly was found in the UK in the sort of 70s, 1970s, so 50 years ago or so. The black spots are where it's found now, so actually where it's found 20 years ago. And it's undergone a rapid range expansion, which is remarkable given that for most of its range, it only uses one host plant, and it's a very special type of host plant that grows only on chalk downland on, on certain type of geology. And we think it's expanded its range by being able to use a new host plant or being able to use one host plant in particular, which only in some parts of its old range was it able to use. So when you see these kinds of rapid expansions, one of the big questions you ask yourself is, you know, has that actually evolution been involved or is it just that they've, you know, that they can use any host plant and just the environment has become suitable for them? So we asked the question, you know, have evolutionary responses driven this shift in host plant use? And we did this uh, working with James Buckley, who's now in Zurich, actually he's now in Plymouth, actually. And Michael de Jong, who's now in Amsterdam, who's a Marie Curie fellow. And Alex uh, van Rensburg, who was with the Swiss National Science Foundation and now is working at UCL with us. And we basically wanted to ask, have the populations in the new part of the range, have they evolved new, new forms of plasticity um, in response to the environment compared to the ones in the old part of the range? And we can do that in two ways. We can do field-based tests of host preference um, and fitness. We can do that. We can show you how we do that in a second. And we can also use population genomics to test for adaptation in the genome. Now, the field-based assays is basically good old solid field-based work. You can do three things. You can plant, put plants in the field of their different host plants to see how many eggs get laid on them. It gives you a kind of population level estimate of their behavior of the females. You can take individual females and put them under cages and look at their choices when you give them a choice of egg of plants. Or you can move cages around in the field to different spots and move butterflies with them and ask them how they lay in different parts, if they, how their choices change in different parts of their range. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the next few minutes. So what you basically do is you transplant individual females either to the new part of the range or to the old part of the range, and you see how they behave. If they do better at home than away, basically. I recommend when you're doing this to use these shopping baskets like from any supermarket. Buy a shopping basket. It's very robust. You can get children jumping up and down on it, and it's still fine. It's quite difficult buying them. That's the only thing that's quite hard is buying a shopping basket in a supermarket is very difficult. I don't know if you've ever tried. 
you go up to the shopkeeper and it's like this kind of existential moment of terror where you want to buy an empty shopping basket and it's impossible because it kind of breaks all the rules. So you have to actually go to the supermarket. Um, you have to go to the head office of the supermarket and order shopping baskets. Okay, so that's my tip. And, and you also create a kind of whole philosophical debate with a shop assistant about whether you can buy an empty basket or not. Anyway, it's a really nice way, and they're a really beautiful system. You can put individual females under there and see how, they, how many eggs they lay in different environments. And we get a really nice result from doing this. Basically, this is the number of eggs that are laid in different places. The north part, sorry, the, the high part, the, the top of the diagram is rock row sites, so the original sites, the old part of the range. And this bottom part is the new part of the range. And the main thing to observe from this is basically that when you take females from the new part of the range and put them back in the old part of the range, they don't lay on their original host plant. Okay? They, they stopped the ability, they've lost the ability to lay on their original host plant. And they just lay on the new host plant. By contrast, the ones that are in the old part of the range seem to have the ability to lay on both the old and the new host plant. Okay, so there's been a rapid evolution going on here, but it's involved a loss of flexibility or plasticity in, that, in those particular populations that have expanded their range. Maybe there's a trade-off to using both, who knows? And then it, then it raises the question, why do these ones use both? What's the advantage of using both? And I'll talk about that in a second. So, it's not often you get such a nice result, clear result as this, as this, but we show a loss of adaptive variation associated with expansion, um, which has allowed them to colonize new environments which only have one host plant. And then we can ask the question, well, you know, using genetic molecular markers, we can ask how have the populations changed during the expansion? How has evolution, has evolution happened during that expansion? And we find sort of like, Quite a lot of gene flows happened within these populations. This is just a principal component analysis of all 20,000 loci, just all of them together. And we kind of show, yeah, there's a bit of structure in latitude here. So there is a latitudinal gradient in genetic diversity, but it's not particularly strong. There are some populations that are a bit weird. This HOD one is actually one of the only populations that is old, but used to use the new host plant. So. It's found in sand dunes, the very warm sand dunes, and it uses the new host plant. So the question becomes, maybe there's been no evolution at all. Maybe they've just shifted. Maybe this population here has just already had existing genotypes that allowed it to use that environment and just moved into these new places. Okay, so that's the hypothesis we want to test, whether there was just a pre-adaptation that was already there that allowed the host shift. Um, I'll just go over this quick. This is just basically showing you that there are regions of the genome that are strongly under selection. So when you look for selective sweeps in the genome, you find evidence for candidate regions of the genome that might be involved in adaptation. So matching the field-based data, it suggests that there has been an evolutionary shift in the last 30 years or so that's allowed the expansion of these populations into new parts of the range. And surprisingly, if you look at these kind of Manhattan plots, a lot of this variation is on the X chromosome, so on the sex chromosome of the, of the butterfly, which is kind of interesting, but I won't talk about that now. But the big question about whether or not it's just been a shift, a movement of individuals from here to here, well, what we do here is we make these gene networks, these kind of networks of, of um, the haplotype networks that basically are sort of constructed from um, variation around selected parts of the genome. And we're basically asking, has there only been one event that was being responsible for this new genotype? Has it just been a movement of individuals wholesale from one place to another? Or have the genes that are under selection come from lots of different places? And the suggestion from these, the fact that these haplotypes networks are very different, even though they all contain genes under selection, tells us that probably, almost certainly, these new forms of adaptation in this part of the range here are completely new and aren't just aren't the same as the host plant use that's found here. So again, that's good news for climate adaptation because it's telling us that there are genes segregating in these parts of the range which allow you to colonize new environments rather than depending on existing populations that use the other host plant. Okay, so the evidence is for rapid assembly of new forms of plasticity in situ during range expansions, which is quite reassuring to some extent. So to summarize this story, which I've gone through very quickly, I appreciate. 
in brown argus, range expansion is associated with um, the evolution of female behavior, rapid female host plant behavior. So she, she puts her eggs in just on one host plant rather than on both. Um, and she's favoring what's really a, quite a widespread host, geranium, which is found in lots more places than rock crows. But it's actually locally quite rare, but it's very widespread. So she can, she can lay her eggs in places that allow colonization in thermally available habitats. Um, it seems that this has happened by the rapid assembly of new forms of plasticity. So it's not from pre-existing forms of plasticity or behavior. It's possibly associated with the sex chromosome, which is kind of neat. Um, and so it's, it's specializing now on a single host plant, which has allowed it to be rescued, if you like, from the consequences of climate change, which probably mean that brown argus is going to become rarer and rarer from the southern populations as it gets too hot for it. So it's shifting its range north, associated with evolution. So what it's done essentially by specializing on one host is it's lost its ability to kind of use two hosts and therefore kind of hedge its bets, if you like, to spread its eggs across more than one host plant. And now it's specializing only on one that allows it to see the environment in a much less patchy way because it's using a much more widespread host plant than, than ones that are just restricted to one type of habitat. So it's smoothing the environment in space, but not in time. Whereas before it was smoothing the environment in time by using different parts of the environment, which is something that uh, Rob and I had a PhD student who was working on the consequences for seasonal variation in climate on how good a host geranium was compared to rock crows. And now the ones in the north part of the range seem to have lost that flexibility and they're just using one host plant. Okay, so we've got lots of ongoing work, um, which I won't talk about. A lot of it, again, is using these shopping baskets to get, try and understand the genes underlying host preference to do kind of um, genotype phenotype associations and then test for selection on those genes. And so coming back to this idea, really what plasticity is doing is it has these complicated effects on evolutionary potential and evolutionary responses. It smooths the environment, so it allows populations to be distributed over wider bits of ecological space. But it also has this consequence of maybe restricting um, adaptive potential, at least until you get to places where genes are doing the wrong thing a lot of the time, which increases the genetic variance in fitness and could rapidly allow the spread of novel forms of sensitivity. The key thing is we don't really understand what organisms are doing until we know their sensitivity. We have to know what their plasticity is like. Um, so the, I mean, the overriding message is that really the, the parameters that we know cause limits to adaptation, they themselves evolve. Uh, they evolve as a, it's what we call life history evolution, is basically the evolution of genotypes which contain different, uh, have different um, combinations of these parameters. And that isn't a static thing, it's a dynamic thing that changes because of evolution. So we've got other stuff we're doing at the moment. We've gone from this looking at one species, we're now looking at many species. So we're now doing what we did in Brown Argus across 20 species or so to ask general questions about whether um, responding to climate change in the UK and expanding your range depends on evolution and how much a re relationship there is between the type of organism you are and how easily you can adapt. So we can get some, try and get some general ideas about where in parameter space populations are in terms of adaptation. We also have a new grant, um, which Alex is heading and Rob is a, is a collaborator on. And Rob also has a new grant, which I'm sure you know about from the Spanish government, which is doing a very complementary things, looking at populations in the mountains around here and asking at what point and in what types of organisms does the way that they behave and their life history and their ecology actually affect when, when and where they're going to dis disappear from communities up and down elevational gradients in, in this part of Spain. So that's one of the reasons that we're here is to talk more about this grant with, with us and with you guys. And I'll just finish there just by putting up some take home messages and I'll stop there so that just exactly at one o'clock so there's a bit of time for questions. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. Noelia, can we do some questions? No. <laughs> okay. So, well, 
you can go and have a beer with John now and ask him some questions. And um, if anyone's watching online and they really want to ask him something, uh, send us an email, I guess. Uh, so, well. We can have questions here. We, they're just not going to be online. So I, I apologize to those of you who are watching in cyberspace. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Any questions here? Anyway, yes. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I, it's um, kind of a related topic with, with your talk. It's, it's basically how the role of hybridization in the context of this population and how this will affect plastic, make quicker the uh, plastic adaptation process. Ah, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, it makes it a lot more complicated. Um, so, it's, I mean, adaptive integration is but beautiful. It's working. It's yes. So, actually, interestingly enough, those two um, Senecio species do have a hybridosome between them, um, and they do exchange genes, and it will be very interesting if hybridization is what's driving a lot of the standing variation. Um, the hybridosome in, in Senecio is quite narrow, so it seems the genes that if there were combinations of genes between the two species that allowed them to use the low or high elevation habitat better, you would expect them to have spread already. Um, so they wouldn't still be segregating in the hybrid zone. But definitely, I think we underestimate for many organisms the degree to which hybridization is benefiting and, and providing variation that, that will allow adaptation. But it mustn't be too much because, well, I mean, yeah, we don't know where genetic variation comes from. I mean, you know, how much of it is from variation within a population from mutation, and how much is from variation across the range. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this, the work we're doing across species is sort of telling us, you know, are there genes currently in the populations which would allow adaptation to new places? Or does, is it going to depend on, um, on gene flow from other species, perhaps? Um, I mean, communities, and at the same time, if the hybridization happens where you lose the species completely, then maybe that's a bad thing, because um, you lose the richness of the communities. But it's limits to adaptation that really cause communities to be rich. It causes there to be these, um, you know, these phenotypic gaps. And the one species does this, and another species, the sort of tangled bank, you know, idea, must come from limits to adaptation at some point. Um, at some point, genes can't move around as much as they might want to. <laughs> Thank you. More questions? Is there, are, are there empirical examples of how climate change is influencing the location of hybrid zones? Any directional movements of hybrid zones? Possibly in Senecio. Possibly it's moving up the mountain, but that, well, that's probably more because of humans building roads that allow them to spread. Um, so definitely anthropogenic change switches hybrid zones. There was a case of butterfly mimicry ring and artia in Ecuador, which has moved because of probably because of uh, um, forests going from being tropical to being mesic. So they're kind of the yeah, but hybrid zones move all the time, um, and they tend to be trapped for a few thousand years and then they move on. But yeah, there are examples, yeah. yeah. Oh, hello. So John, I was... Oh, fine. Um, so the Sinesha, you are showing that there is genetic variation that it allows individuals to distribute themselves to the system. So is it just a dispersal limitation thing that all those individuals that are being produced are just sitting in a place where they are elsewhere? So what is preventing them from moving across the landscape? We, we think it, it's trade-offs. So we think it's because those things that do well at the edge of the range, or sorry, the novel environments, don't do as well in the native range. So although those alleles might be, might be fine in some genotypes, where they're expressed, 
in like a proportion of those genotypes, they won't get established because they'll be outcompeted. But if the environment changes in the native range, it might well be they start getting better in that range and then they'll start to seed. And the seedling results make that point even more strongly. But it seems that as a seedling, it's really important to try and anticipate the future. So what, what seedlings do with their roots seems to really matter. So it seems like when you do the seed experiments, you get an even stronger trade-off that um, seed families from fathers who had genotypes that did well in the novel part of the range do much worse as seeds in the native part of the range. But it becomes so messy with seeds because you have to look at family means as opposed to just looking at individual genotypes where you've got the same genotype. What is it doing here? What's it doing there? Like us moving around, you know, to different parts of the world and how do we behave in different places? It's the same kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think that's what's happening. And, and the, I guess the idea would be as the, as the average environment changes, maybe those extreme forms become more common and they can seed the edge. Yeah. I mean, we grew because we grew all those crosses. We grew them from seed. They were basically grown from seed, in, but in the laboratory, and then we took cuttings from them. But now we're doing the actual seeds and moving those bodily. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, dispersal in space is migration, and dispersal in time is phenology. <laughs> you know. Um, sorry. Thank you very much. Well, your your research is uh, very far from my topic of research, so I, I apologize if my question is over. It's far from mine as well. <laughs> it's far from it's mine. Mini leather similar. So, uh, yes, at some point in your talk, you mentioned quantified genetic variation. What do you mean exactly by that? Um, genetic variation, what do you mean you measure? in the first part of your talk. So, so, that, so there's different ways of measuring genetic variation in fitness. A simple way of doing it is by asking how do different genotypes do in different places. So you've got your cuttings, they're different genotypes, and you know that they're genetically different. Um, and you basically ask what proportion of the variation in fitness in that population is down to variation in genes. So variation in the frequency of genes within a genotype. And that's what we call heritability. So it's the idea so you're of looking at the gene level. Yeah, we're using so so no, but not using we are using genomics, but in that case we're basically asking so so what we did in that experiment, we went beyond that and we looked at the uh, the average effect of a father or a mother on fitness. So you go back and you say, okay, let's look at this particular genotype, this parental genotype, and look at all of her offspring, what's the average effect of having that person as your mother on your fitness in the population? And that tells you how much of that variation in the phenotype is transmissible through the genome. And we call that additive variance. So it's the, it's the effect on fitness or on, a, or on a trait that's down to the effect of, the average effect of those genes across lots of different genotypes. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know if you probably already know that, but we, it's a quantity. So, we, so we're looking at the means and the variances in fitness and the proportion of that variation that's down to who is your mum and who is your dad. Um, in the cuttings experiments that we did before, which I haven't mentioned, we just asked genotype, how much do different genotypes vary? But not all of that variation because of genotype is actually transmissible um, because some of it is because of associations between genes along the genome. So what we're really doing is trying to quantify how much of the variation in the population in fitness is down to families. Um, and that tells us how much gene frequencies can change as a result of selection. So if there's loads of variance in a population in fitness, if none of that is genetic, is, is down to genes that vary in their frequency, then, then no evolution can happen. You get lots of selection, but no evolution. Um, okay, and uh, all along your talk, the concept of plasticity appears, and it is not clear to me which what is plasticity, which is for, ex for 
if it's a relationship with resilient resilient uh, resilient uh, ability to adapt i don't know I, I don't know is the exact meaning of plasticity in this context yeah so i define plasticity in one of the things that's challenging about working on plasticity is lots of people define it in different ways. I define it as the ability of one genotype to make more than one phenotype. So that is basically that's, but that, but that sensitivity of genes has evolved because of natural selection. So the fact that we have, we respond to the environment in certain ways, that's, that's actually most of what evolution is doing is making genes which together make decisions to make phenotypes like us. So is this kind of related to development? Yes. Yeah, it's related to development, yeah. Um, yeah, and sometimes that development is that those decisions are irreversible, and sometimes they're reversible. So a plant deciding to flower at different times, if it lives for many years, it's basically making decisions that might vary between years. But decisions like how many legs you have, they're pretty irreversible. So only some things can be plastic. Um, and there's a lot of theory about why that is. But yeah, it's, it's, it's intricately connected with development. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. The thing is, I'm not that much in this evolutionary things, but I'm very obsessed about climate change. So when you're talking about climate change, you mean increase in temperature over time, is that? Partly. Um, actually, Alex knows a lot more about climate change than I do, but he can answer. <laughs> so you speak to him. No. But, but yeah, so, so there's, there's three aspects to climate change, I think. Uh, one is, an, on average, a change in temperature over time, mostly increases in temperature, but not always. Secondly, an increase in the variation in temperature between years. And thirdly, a reduction in the predictability, certainly compared to what historical patterns were like. And I think they, they represent three quite different challenges. And I think the average is moving, but also the extremes are becoming bigger and less predictable. And the example I often use is like um, organisms that live on the coast, you know, in intertidal zones. They can cope with big changes in the environment. So that's okay because the, the change is really predictable. So the tide comes in and they're immersed in water, in salt water for half the time and the rest of the time they're not. This time of year in the Spanish coast, that's a huge difference. But because it's predictable, they can prepare for it. But what's happening here is organisms can't make decisions about, or genes can't make decisions about what to do in the future because they haven't got much information from now about what the future is going to be like. Mm -hmm. okay. And for how long do you have this data for, uh, for example, this variability of the average of temperature? For how long is that? So those data are harder to get um, because they often, have, they often are occurring on much finer scales. So what the point from the point of view of an organism, how they experience the environment is very much a question of their their longevity and their how much they move, um, and how much they can tolerate extremes. Um, Rob's an expert in this stuff, so I feel I feel guilty talking about it. But um, we're starting to really understand models of the way that climate varies on a fine scale, because global changes in temperature are very different to how organisms experience the environment. Yeah, exactly. That's why, because climate has very different dimensions, and um, for example, in some parts, you're experiencing a lot of fluctuations or probability of extreme events, and in some parts, they have experiencing velocity of climate change, high velocity. So how all these together, and some parts are experiencing both of them. So how to start um, responding to this? I think that it means experiencing more. Alex, Alex, do you want to answer that? <laughs> no, but I think that's, I think, you know, I speak to a lot of climate scientists and, and in our institute, we speak to a lot of climate scientists and a lot of them are earth scientists and they imagine that just organisms are kind of passive in how they respond to the environment. But of course, organisms make the environment and that's kind of, I suppose, one of my slides is all about their ability to smooth 
environmental variation. I guess the concern for me is um, their ability to do that is being compromised because they're, they're no longer in, an, in a world that they understand. It's like us with social media, you know, it's causing us to make all kinds of sh rubbish decisions. Um, and, and because, you know, we, we no longer can judge the, the truth and the, the value of the information we're getting. And I think as we sort of march into situations where the average is now at the extreme of what, what was previously encountered, every time, the every time you go above a certain level, it's going to kill a lot of things. Or they'll start to do terrible things like vote for Trump or something. So, um, so that's, the, that's the dilemma. But we have to try and understand. I think the, where biology intervenes and affects tipping points, that's, and how that varies across ecosystems, I think that's probably the big... Certainly, I mean, Alex and Rob and I have discussed this, and I'm sure you have as well. It's, that's the big question for biologists, I think. Um, so definitely something that at CEBRA we're thinking a lot about. Where, where are the non-linearities? Yeah, thank you. I think that's enough questions, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. I can go. Okay, thank you very much, John. Well thank done. you, everyone. Thank you all for coming as well, of course. Have a good summer. <laughs>